Hi guys! This video is a compressed summary of our first live session on the Soconet V2 challenge. We present the data, the tasks, and the evaluation metrics with some Python demonstrations of useful functions from our Soconet pip package. Big thanks to all researchers who participated in the discussions and questions that followed the session. And for those of you who couldn't be there, feel free to join the next session, which will be held this Friday at 1 p.m. UTC. We will show you some of the resources that you can find on our dev kit with some benchmark methods to get you started on the challenge. This will be your chance to ask questions and discuss some ideas. The link for the meeting is in the description below. Feel free to subscribe to our channel to stay updated on the latest news and enjoy. So if you're here, it means that you are interested in SoccerNet, especially SoccerNet V2 and maybe the competition that we are organizing. And so this live session is about explaining a bit more in detail the data sets, the tasks, uh, introduce ourselves, and then give details about the challenge. And um, it's also uh, very casual. So it means that you can interact with us, you can ask questions, uh, you can raise an issue, you can make a joke if you want, you can grab a beer if you want. Well, just It's like if we were all together in the same room and just, just chatting with each other. So don't hesitate. So what's, uh, what, what is there in the data set? So there are 550 games. There are 500 games from the original SoccerNet data set, which uh, some of you might know which was published by Silvio a few years ago. So it was in 2018, I think. And we added 50 games for the challenge, uh, which are uh, on Eval AI, as you have seen maybe. So the games are taken from the best European uh, championships. So La Liga, Liga, Serie A, Premier League, Bundesliga, and Champions League. And um, there are a few seasons that are covered. So three seasons from 2014 to 2017, something like that. And so the matches are untrimmed. So these are the broadcast untrimmed videos. There are two half times per match. And um, yeah, that's, um, that makes it quite a big, big uh, data set because we didn't trim the videos. That, so that's make it a bit difficult somehow. So you have access to these untrimmed videos with a high quality video. You can also access low quality videos if you want, because it's easier to process, for example. And you can also access ResNet features. So that's features computed with ResNet 152 that Silvia computed uh, with the original SoccerNet data set. And on our side, we worked mainly with these features because it's really easier to process than reading all the videos and all the frames and so on. And we can already achieve quite good results. So don't be afraid of just using those features if you want as a start. Um, so these are the, the, the data. And about the annotations, we provide 300,000 manual temporal annotations. So these are anchors, timestamps in the data, in the videos that are referred to actions or cameras and replays. So we have 17 classes of actions. I will speak about that a bit later and 13 camera types. And also we have replays which are notated as um, linked to, to their actions. So we have a few demos and Anthony will now show you how to download the data and the, the annotations. So yeah, I, I wanted to show you uh, actually uh, during this, this demo a bit uh, how to use the uh, SoccerNet pip package so that uh, we put in place so that you can easily download all the data that you need um, from, from SoccerNet. So what we're going to do is that we're going to start really from scratch. So I have this folder uh, and let's say that I want to um, save my data into this uh, data set folder. So how, how should I proceed? Well, I will get back to the terminal. What I'm going to do first is that I am going to create a Conda environment. So basically, I'm going to do Conda create, let's call it uh, SoccerNet 
environment and I'm going to use Python 3.8, but basically it can work with any 3.6 and above, uh, at least Python versions. So this is going to create my environment. I just have to check uh, yes here. Very basic stuff. Uh, simply activate my environment. So now I'm in the new environment. And all I, I have to do is pip install Sockernet, which will automatically fetch the uh, Sockernet pip package and which we will be able to use uh, directly. All right. So now I have everything. I can go into a Python uh, console. I guess it's the word. Um, and I can define the path where I want to save my data set. So which will basically be uh, dot slash data set, as I showed you. And then I will start importing the downloader from the pip package. So from soccernet dot downloader, very easy name to remember, import the soccernet. Oh. downloader and that's it then all i have to do is to name a variable so for instance my soccer net downloader and i will say that uh, this is an instance of the class that we just imported and we're going to specify where we want to uh, save the data set so here path data set then this, uh, this uh, class and this object that we just created as a download games uh, function. So basically, my soccer net downloader dot download games. And inside of there, I will specify which game, uh, which uh, type of files I want to uh, download. So for instance, uh, if I want the ResNet features, I will download all first half of uh, the games of ResNet, uh, which were computed using TensorFlow 2 and are uh, reduced by PCA 512.npy. So these are the files um, that, that we want. And let's say we want, of course, uh, the second half as well. So this is simply a list of all the file types that we want for, for all the games. So basically, I would write the same stuff. And then I have to specify for which split of the data set I want these, um, these, uh, these files. So I will specify the split with a list as well. So let's say that I want them the, the games from the train set, from the test set, and from the validation set. I can just do that right here. I can simply hit enter, and it will start downloading, as you can see. So now it's downloading the uh, Chelsea Burnley uh, game, so first and second half. Then it will move on to another game, and so on. So I'm just going to stop it there, of course, because I'm not going to download the entire data set uh, again. But I can show you that um, now inside of the folder, I have this England EPL, which is the league from which uh, the data set was, uh, the, the, the few games that I downloaded are from. And I can see that I have uh, my game with the two, uh, the two ResNet features uh, right there. So let me get back to the terminal now. Um, yeah, so back to the, the downloader. Uh, so let's say that um, now I, I have these um, features and I want to have the videos because I want to move on to, to something more complicated. Um, as Adrian said, we provide the videos in two formats. So low quality, which is 224 by 398, something like that, uh, which is very low quality 
for uh, looking at the game, but which might be uh, enough for algorithm because you can already recognize uh, all the actions that we annotated. And we actually annotated the actions on, on these videos. And you also have, uh, if you're truly an adventurer, uh, the HQ videos, uh, which are uh, basically 720p or 180p, and uh, which then makes really a, a large amount of data. So to download the video, uh, you have to first fill in an NDA on the Soconet website because we, we don't have the rights over these videos, there, but we can share them for, for research. And um, providing that you also say that you won't uh, release them somewhere else, so which is why we, we needed you to fill a, an NDA. So once you fill the NDA, you will receive a password. So just for the sake of the video, I won't write the password inside. So I, I've actually uh, simply put it uh, in, a, in a file, which is called uh, password. So I will simply fetch my password here. always good closing your files in Python. And then I can uh, get back to my object, my Soconet downloader. Sorry, I have a bit of a problem with the spelling. So this uh, Soconet downloader has a variable that's called password and simply put uh, it right there. And then I can go back to my uh, download uh, line right here, and I can simply change uh, what I want as file. So for the uh, HQ videos, this is one underscore HQ dot MKV, which which are are all the first halves of of uh, videos, and for the uh, low quality, it's basically just one dot MKV. And if you wanted the second half, you could put two dot MKV. So for instance, this line will download all second half in low quality and all first half in high quality. So right now it should work. Yeah, it's downloading. So as you can see, it takes a bit more time than for the, um, um, than for the uh, features, of course, because the videos are, are a bit larger in size. If you want to download all, low queue videos, it will be around 100 megabyte, uh, gigabytes or between 100 and 200 at least. But for the HQ video, it's more than one terabyte if I remember correctly. So make sure that you have everything, uh, well, enough space before downloading the, the HQ video or, or else you will have a problem with uh, your memory. So I'm just waiting for the first video to download so that we can see uh, where it was stored. So I'm gonna check for the first game. I guess it was in the same order. Yep. And yes, I have the second video and the first one that is not, uh, that it, uh, is still being uh, downloaded uh, right now. But uh, basically it will put them in the same folder as the ResNet feature, so, which is very easy. And finally, I wanted to show you how to download the labels. Um, so it's exactly the same um, line, but instead of putting the videos, we're gonna just try to, uh, we're gonna go and get the labels. So which are called labels.v2.json. If you take the labels. Uh, no. Yeah, the, yeah. Um, if you simply, uh, put label.json, it will download the first version, which only contained goal, card, and substitutions. But these labels v2.json contain everything else. So of course, for here, you can only uh, download them for the train test and validation set. Uh, the challenge set, you won't be able to, to download them. Um, and it's exactly the same kind of line, and it will download everything. For the replay grounding, it's just another name for the labels. It's labels.camera, uh, cameras, plural, uh, dot JSON. And basically the same line and it will download everything in the, in the same folder 
with the ResNet features and the um, and the videos. So that's it for my first uh, demonstration. All right. So um, so we have a few tasks that can be tackled with our data set. So of course the first stars is action spotting, which is uh, spotting actions when they appear. I will talk about that just after. There is also camera shot segmentation and replay grounding. So these are the three tasks that we defined with the data set. And there are two of these tasks for the challenge. So the challenge is about action spotting and replay grounding. So action spotting is about telling at which frame an action occurs. So for example, if there is a penalty which is shot, you have to say on this frame, the penalty is shot because that's how it's annotated. The annotation is a timestamp. So it means that all the frames are an annotated with just nothing. And then one frame for the penalty at the moment where the player sh shoots is annotated as the penalty. And that's the frame that you have to retrieve to perform the action spotting task. And so for example, if there is a penalty and then a goal, you have to retrieve the frame of the shot of the penalty and then the frame of the shot of the goal. So do, you have two classes to retrieve and two moments to retrieve. So you have to spot the exact frame of the actions. We have 17 classes of actions. So basically we tried to think about every interesting action in soccer. So we have penalty, we have goal, we have corner, we have free kick, we have indirect free kick, we have offside, we have kickoff, we have throw in, ball out of play, we have clearance. Uh, we have full, we have red card, yellow card, red then yellow, yellow then red card. Uh, substitution, I might be missing one, I stopped counting, but yeah, we have 17 classes of actions. Uh, so in total for the 500 games that are available, uh, not the challenge games, we have 110,000 annotations, so timestamps, actions that are annotated, which is really huge. So with each timestamp, we annotated the action class, which type of action is this? We annotated the team. So is it the home or the away team? So for each match, you have a home and a away team, of course. And we annotated also if the action is shown or unshown. So what does it mean? Sometimes in a broadcast video, an action might not be shown by the producer. For example, if there is a ball out of play after an interesting shot, then you may have a clearance by the goalkeeper. But sometimes the producer shows a replay of the action of the shot and does not show the clearance. But you know it has to happen. And so sometimes there are actions that are not shown, such as the clearance that I'm just saying about, which is annotated as precisely as possible, of course, but which is unshown. Or uh, when there is a ball out of play, you know that there will be a throw-in, but sometimes you cannot see the throw-in because the producer is showing something else. So that's the shown versus unshown tag. Uh, that is an additional one uh, from which we can also split the performances and so on as we done in the paper. So about the files, uh, the label files and the prediction files, as you can see, the label files takes, um, well, gives the, the, the name of the match, the file of the match, Manchester versus Arsenal here, and then um, dictionary about annotations. And the dictionary is made of a list of smaller dictionaries, which are composed of uh, information about each action. So each small dictionary here is an action. There is the game time, for example, the second one, there is a game time here. Uh, so the first one here is about the first half of the game. Then when it occurs, there is a label, which is the type of action. The position is uh, the time in milliseconds in the game. There is the team tag that we talked about. Uh, it's not applicable for ball out of play because uh, of course it's the opposite of the throw in team. And we didn't, didn't spend a bit of time to um, annotate the team for ball out of play. And there is the visibility tag. So visible or not shown, this one is not shown. So this is the label file. And about the prediction file, so the file that we have to produce and to upload uh, for evaluation is on the right. So basically you have to follow the same structure. You have to produce a game time, a label, a position in milliseconds, the half, which is already given, and a confidence score between zero and one. 
So the confidence score basically is the extra information that you must provide compared with the label file. And so you provide a list, well, uh, 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 you provide small dictionaries, yeah. A, a dictionary with a list of small dictionaries that mm -hmm. contain each action, but with the same structure as the label file. You don't have to worry about uh, too much this because you can take our code and produce the, the good files in the right format with our own codes. There is no magic in there. So what do you have to do when you have your predictions? You have to upload them on our Evalei server where we stored the labels and an evaluation function. So we don't store uh, the, the, the data, we just store the labels and we compare your predictions with our labels through our evaluation function. And the evaluation function computes an average MAP. So this is a performance metric, which means average mean average precision, which is quite complicated, but we will explain in a few minutes. And um, we give you a score, which is your score on the test set or the challenge set, depending on what you are submitting. So now uh, Anthony will make a demo of that. Right now I've prepared this, uh... Um, actually, I've prepared uh, my labels, which are in this uh, labels folder. So, which were basically downloaded using the previous command line that I've used. So, inside of each league and each game, I have this labels uh, v2.json. And what I've also already done is that I've run my uh, model, which is the benchmark, one of the benchmark, uh, cal the calf benchmark, and I've saved the predictions inside uh, again of each game. So basically this is the structure that you will have to provide for your uh, predictions as well. So it's exactly the same structure as the, uh, as the data set structure. So separated in each league uh, with the correct name, separated for each year and for each game. So basically if you've, um, you can use one function that is called get list games, uh, which takes as an argument the um, the split of the data set, and it will give you all the path that you have to create. Uh, so all of these paths, and inside of these, I have my JSON file, so that Adrian just showed you. Um, all right. So if I get back to my terminal right now. I can uh, import uh, from Socknet before it was do dot downloader. Now it's dot evaluation. Dot we're going to specify for which task. So here action spotting. If you want to do it for replay grounding, it's basically the same, but dot replay grounding with a capital uh, R and capital G. Import and we're going to import a function that is called evaluate. All right, now I'm going to set up two paths. So the path of my predictions, which as you've seen was slash predictions, and a path for my labels, which was dot slash labels. And my results, I will compute them using the function evaluate. And I will put Socknet path. So this is my data set path, uh, which is the labels I've called it. Up. Um, my prediction path, which is path predictions. The split on which I'm going to evaluate. So here you will be able to test it using the train validation or a test split, but basically more the evaluation or uh, the, the validation or test split, of course. Then I, I can specify the version, but I guess um, that it was already, that it's already in, in this uh, default uh, two. Uh, so this is Socanet V2 for the 17 classes. And I'm going to just specify the names, the individual names of my prediction files, um, which are in this case, predictions v2.json. All right, so this should 
Yeah, uh, just messed up with an S, missing S. So this will compute uh, for all 100 games, as you've seen, it, it went uh, pretty quickly. Uh, for all 100 game, it will uh, compute, of the test set, it will compute the average MAP metric. So right now it's computing it. So it takes 12 steps, as we will see just after. And then I can show my results. So for instance, if I want to get the average MAP, I will just say average MAP. This is a, actually the results uh, is a dictionary. And so we can see that I have 41.6%, uh, which is written as 0 0.41. I can also uh, get it per class. So right there, I have uh, all the classes, the, the performance for each class separately. You also have this, this uh, average MAP for the visible classes. So, which is a bit higher than here for, for us, which is a bit higher. And for the uh, unshown classes, which is a bit uh, lower, well, even much lower. So the important metric for the challenge is the average MAP. Yeah, uh, um, I just wanted to give you a bit more details about the, the action uh, spotting task. So the, the metric that we use, the average MAP, because it's, it's not a metric that is straightforward like to explain like the precision or or the recall or or the accuracy it's it's a bit more tricky so i wanted to show you graphically a bit how um, this uh, average map uh, works because if you know how it works you can adapt of course your own uh, results to try to maximize uh, this average map so basically we will take this example uh, at the bottom of the of the slide where we have two ground truth actions. Um, so let's say that the first one was the penalty and the second one is, uh, is well, it has to be the same action here. So two penalties or two, two, two faults, uh, something like that. Um, so the same kind of action. And we have two predictions which are shown in green. So the green lines, which are close to the um, the ground truth somehow, uh, more or less. And we will see how uh, we, we can uh, evaluate on that. Because we, we figured out that using simply retrieving the exact frame is something that is too complicated. Because even in the annotation, it is sometimes very difficult to, to have a precise frame. We try to be as precise as possible, of course, but it's gonna it's, it, it's always going to be a bit uh, difficult for algorithm to say the frame just before is not the action and the, the, the frame that I have is the action and the frame right after is not the action. Uh, so we th this metric was introduced in that sense. So it's a metric that is close to what is done in object detection, actually. Um, so I have these two ground truth and these two predictions. And what we're going to do is that we're going to step by step um, define some intervals around these ground truths, where we say that, all right, if a prediction falls within this, uh, this, um, this interval around the ground truth, then it means that it was a good enough prediction and we consider it as a, a true positive. Um, and we're gonna do that for several intervals and then try to do some kind of averaging of, of these results. So the intervals are gonna go from five seconds around the action. Uh, so basically two point half second before and 2.5 seconds after to 60 seconds. So 30 seconds before and 30 seconds after the action, which is very loose uh, as an evaluation. So um, these are uh, 12 steps that you've seen uh, when I evaluated, we had this counter that counted from zero to, uh, from one to 12. So these were actually the, what was computed was with different intervals. So if we take a look at the first interval right here, so with a delta of five seconds, um, we have no uh, prediction that fall within these intervals. So this is gonna count as two false positive because my predictions do not fall within an interval and two false negatives. Because for each ground truth, I have no predictions each inside of my intervals. If we take a look at 10 seconds, 
now we have this prediction on the right that falls within the ground truth uh, on the right. So this prediction is going to count as a true positive. But the other one does not fall within another interval, an interval of another ground truth. So this will be a false positive. And I still have my ground truth on the left that uh, has no prediction associated, which is one false negative. And finally, if I have delta equal 15 uh, seconds, I have uh, both of my predictions that fall within each of the ground truth is interval. So this one falls within the, the one on the right and the other one on the one on the left. And so I have two true positives. So as you can see, my count on my confusion matrix is going to change depending on the uh, delta interval. And as I said, we're going to do that for each class separately at first. So we're going to consider all predictions of penalty, let's say, and all uh, labels of penalty. And we're going to compute uh, this, uh, this average AP. So. Once, uh, once we've defined our class and our interval, what we're going to do is that we're going to uh, compute one confusion matrix per threshold on the confidence score. So these predictions that I've shown here, well, they are, were associated with a confidence score. So for, for instance, something that uh, is greater than 0 0.5 for both. Well, what we're going to do is that we're going to consider 200 of these threshold between 0 and 1. And we're going to take all the predictions that are above this threshold. So the threshold is the moving um, dotted line that you can see on the GIF. Um, and, um, and all the ones that are below are going to be discarded, not considered. From this confusion matrix that we have, so counting the true positive, false positive, and false negatives as we did um, as, as we did just before. This is going to allow us to compute the precision and recall for that class, that delta, and that threshold. And as you can see, as the threshold is moving, we are actually adding more points into this precision recall uh, curve. So once we have all the points for the 200 uh, different thresholds. We're going to approximate this function by the rightmost max value, uh, which basically says that uh, the value for each recall is basically it's um, the value of the the highest value that uh, on that is on the right, so which has a, a greater recall. So, for instance, um, let's say that I'm I don't know if you see my mouth actually, um, probably. So if you're uh, right here on the curve, you're going to take the value that is the upper in this uh, region on the right. And so from there, we're going to compute the area under this uh, curve in the same fashion as in the pascal voc data set, which is basically saying that I'm going to take the value of this, gray, uh, of this um, green function for the zero point recall, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, up to one. Uh, and I'm going to average all these points. So the sum divided by 11, because I have 11 points. Uh, so this is going to give me uh, what we call the average precision. Uh, and I can put this average precision in an average precision for each delta curve. So this uh, area right there gives me this point. And I can repeat um, the same process for all delta and get uh, an average precision for each uh, delta curve. From there, last step, almost, <laughs> we can compute the average, so the area under that curve, uh, using this time a trapezoid formula for integrals, so which is basically considering that uh, each uh, of these points is, uh, is uh, linked with a, a straight line. And this will give me what we call the average AP. And then I can simply for do that, that computation for each class in my data set, average these average APs, and I get the final average MAP. So as you can see, it's not uh, really a straightforward 
um, computation um, for, for this uh, metric. So which is why we provided everything uh, for you to compute it uh, directly in the PIP package, because otherwise it's not uh, that straightforward to re-implement. But really the idea is to, to, to have a metric that is independent on um, that is independent on the, the threshold, the, the confidence score threshold, as in every detection of problems, and to also be independent on the accuracy somehow that we want to have uh, close to our uh, ground truth. So, which is why we average over these different uh, delta uh, intervals, which means that, for instance, if your algorithm is only good at 20 seconds, uh, and if we considered that uh, only the, the delta equals five, well, it would have very poor results, while uh, 10 seconds before and 10 seconds after an action can sometimes be uh, enough for some applications. Um, so this was a fair way to represent. So what, what I would say um, is that it's important to, to, to understand that this confidence score all confidence scores are evaluated, uh, and that will put a, a precision recall curve, uh, a point in the precision recall curve, and that is averaged over different uh, precisions uh, in time as well. So yeah, basically that's the the uh, metric for action spotting. So what about the replay grounding task? What is this? That's a novel task that we defined in our paper, Sakarnet V2, which is uh, on archive already. So the replay grounding task, it consists in taking a replay of an action and trying to find which action is replayed, but which action during the live game, of course. So for example, here, you have on the left a video of a goal. So there is someone scoring a goal, which is the, the live broadcast. You know, you don't know if the goal is going to happen, but there is a goal. Then, as always, when there is a goal, there are plenty of replays. And in this case, on the right, you can see a replay of that goal. Well, the task here is to start with that replay and to say, okay, this replay points to this action. So given a replay, find where the action is located in the video. So that's some kind of action spotting task if you want, but conditioned by the replay sequence. And in this case, we don't ask you to identify the action which is replayed, but we just ask you to locate the action which is replaced, replayed. So overall in the data set, we have almost 33,000 replay sequences that can be extracted and that you should link uh, to their action. That can be linked to their actions. We provide the annotations for that. So regard regarding the files, labels and predictions files, uh, there is not much different. Uh, so there is just for uh, the label files, you can see that there is a link entry and the link entry just takes uh, the, the action information that we showed in the action spotting part. So uh, we have the, oh, sorry. So, so this is the label, the camera labels files. So you have the type of change of camera. So you can have logo transition, you have fading transitions and you can have abrupt transitions. You have the location of the change of camera. You have the type of camera that was shown just before the label, the timestamp. And if the sequence shows uh, an action, then you have the link with the information of that action. A replay. Of the, the replay, sorry. You have the position in milliseconds in the video. And you have uh, the fact that the timestamp shows a replay or not. There's a replay or not. So these are the, the labels camera json files they contain information about the camera changes and about the replays there there is no separate file for or the replays only so regarding the predictions what you have to output is um, a file like this so again you can use our codes but uh, basically you have to say okay for this replay which is on this game on this half which starts here and ends there you have to say here are all my possible detections of course it's better if you have only one and if it's a good one but you can output as many detections as you want with um time uh, in seconds this time and a score between zero and one 
So for example, in this case, well, the most probable one is uh, at 158 seconds and the confidence of 0 0.98. For the replay that starts here and ends here. So it's the replay, which is there on the left. Uh, it yeah, starts, starts here. here and ends just after uh, here. So again, uh, those files are available to you and um, uh, the output format is, is done automatically in the comments. And the same goes for the evaluation and eval AI. So you uh, send the prediction files, we compare them with our label files with an evaluation function and the evaluation function gives you a score, which is this time the average AP average, average precision because we don't ask you to identify the class. So we don't have the M of MAP because this M is about the, the, the average across the classes. So this time it's just average AP. So with the data sets, you can also perform the task of camera shot segmentation and boundary detection. It's not in the challenge, but you can also try to tackle that task. If you are interested in knowing when the camera changes or which type of camera is shown, you can use the information that we provide. So uh, we provide information for 13 types of cameras and three types of camera transitions that I just described. And the task here, which we describe in the paper, is to say, OK, now at this frame or between these two frames, this frame, there is a camera change. And the sequence that we have just seen is a main camera, for example, or um, corner camera or something like that. Uh, you can perform the classification of the camera type for each frame, which is the camera shot segmentation, and the boundary detection is about the changes of the, the cameras. So I won't spend too much time on this because it's not in the challenge, but you can find all the details in the, the archive paper. Okay, so for the as a recap, we have three tasks, action spotting, camera shots, and uh, replay grounding, but for a challenge, you have action spotting and replay grounding. We have uh, many classes, many annotations. You have the numbers here. And uh, we, you can use all the tags that we provided to train your models and to provide your outputs. There is no problem about that. Um, a few details about the, the practical details about the challenge. So as we mentioned, there is a public leaderboard on Eval AI. And we have a prize for action spotting and for replay grounding, which is $500 each, which is sponsored by Sagan Spectrum. We don't work for Second Spectrum, but they agreed to uh, sponsor the challenge. Um, when I was uh, speaking with them, they told me that sometimes they are looking for talented computer vision scientists. So maybe that if you win the prize or if you develop an interesting method, you can also contact them and uh, you will maybe have some opportunity to work with them. Uh, so the deadline for the challenge is at the end of May, uh, May 30 at 11.59 PM PCT. So just this is like for uh, conferences deadline. And we ask as deliverable, we ask the results, of course, but these are on Eval AI. And you, we ask a small report. So two pages max, it's OK. It's a technical report just for us to have a look at what you've done. Uh, because if you have the best results because you annotated manually the matches, of course, we will not give you the price. It, it does not count. So a technical report, two pages, you don't have to make a state of the art, you don't have to make an introduction or something like that, but just describe the method, how you obtained your results. Uh, and that's very good. Of course, we highly encourage you to release the code so that we can test it on our side, but it's not mandatory because maybe some of you work for companies and cannot release the codes and we perfectly understand that. So there is no problem if you don't have the right to share the code it's not mandatory uh, to be eligible for a prize. And as Silvio said, you might submit a paper if you want to write scientific paper for MM Sports because the deadline is, uh, is the end of June. So it's after CVPR. And uh, if you have an interesting method, even if it's not ranked first, it might be ranked fifth or something like that. You can always write a method, a paper, describing the method, the results and so on. And it can be accepted by the reviewers. Uh, we might serve as reviewers ourselves. Um, so uh, don't hesitate to, to participate to MM Sports as well. Yeah, so the, the, the best, well, the, the interesting part um, is really the novelty 
that you, that you bring or or the insight that you can bring on one on, on something or some classes or or anything that that maybe even if you're not the best th this can still be uh, valuable so don't hesitate to to write a paper even if you're uh, not ranked first, as Adrian said. And don't hesitate to submit results even if you feel that you will not be ranked first. So for example, if you test your codes on the test set of SoccerNet, and if you notice that you are below the public leaderboard, well, don't hesitate to submit anyway for a challenge. It's better to have a large table and you can see your rank and so on than just keeping the result for yourself. It's, it's a challenge, but it's for fun as well. So don't be afraid of submitting results, even if you feel that they are not super good. You can always improve over time and there is absolutely no problem for that. Yeah. So just um, as a few recaps, so you have the links here, but of course you cannot click them because we are sharing a screen. So we will share them, uh, but you have seen them already, I guess. So the paper uh, has been accepted for CV Sports in June. So the publication will appear officially, but you can find it on archive already. We have the dev kit, we have the Discord channel that most of you are already uh, in, I guess, the evaluation server, and we have our own YouTube channel on which we are going to post this video if you want to uh, see it again because you like to hear us speaking or if you just want more details about uh, the, the competition and so on. Um, Anthony, you wanted to add something about the dev kit maybe or not? Oh, sorry, what did I do? <laughs> no problem uh no i guess oh, so I, that we have uh, I thought there was an extra slide um you yeah, know i i think we we've covered already enough material for today we can we can keep uh everything for the next uh, tutorial i think so so, so what we're going to do is uh, that we're going to have these meetings uh very um well weekly uh, we're going to try to to have them uh weekly uh, where we're going to present uh, different kind of things uh, revolving around the challenge. So I can already tell you that for the next session, which will be most probably on Friday next week, uh, but I, I'm, we, we will confirm that uh, in the coming uh, in the coming days on Discord. Uh, on Discord, yeah. Uh, so we we will talk about the method that uh, we've we've uh, presented in the paper so which is the context aware loss function method the netvlad max and uh, max pool method for action spotting and we're going to present also uh, the um, our re our first replay grounding uh, benchmark um, which is also based on the same uh, networks so we will go a bit into the the the, the details of the code as well just to so that you can um, we we're going to show you where you can adapt the different parts of the code to uh, insert your network if you only wish to uh, to to change the network architecture where uh, how we load the data so that you can um, also make changes if you feel like some changes need to be done and so that you don't have to start from scratch and writing a whole new code so yeah basically that's going to be the the topic of the next week and in the following weeks we will actually invite uh, some of the authors who worked on SockerNet v1 and are some, for some of them uh, working on, on SockerNet v2 as well to present uh, their methods uh, that they've already uh, published in, in peer reviewed papers. Um, so this can also uh, give you some, some, some ideas uh, for your own research, of course. So make sure to, to, to follow them and uh, we hope we can see you there. Well, um, thank you for joining. Don't hesitate to submit your results on Eval AI. Hopefully we can create a whole community and have a lot of results. And um, we keep in touch. We will organize meetings. Uh, of course, we could organize a small drink, a virtual drink at the end of the competition if you want. Um, but uh, yeah, in the meantime, take care and uh, see you later. Yeah, bye. Bye. See you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye thank guys. You.